reserved for posterity. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, let me just check. Can people on, uh, can somebody on Zoom tell me that they can hear us? Um, and then uh, with that, we can let Carolyn actually do the introduction. Oh, great. <laughs> OK, well, I'm very excited to be able to introduce our speaker of today, Sabina Shah. I have been uh, looking forward to this for a very long time. Um, she is the Managing Director in AI Research at J.P. Morgan and the Head of product, uh, product and Transformation for Wholesale Client Onboarding. Um, she's a frequent industry speaker, including on TED.com and Keynotes and Ichikai and KDB. She's also won several paper awards um, and industry recognitions, including the Microsoft Top PhD of the Year Award, Cloudera Top AI ML Application Award for Reuters um, Tracer, a Google Women in Engineering Award, White House CTO Council nomination, and a Nina Board Technical Leadership Award finalist. So she uh, is obviously of a very high stature, and we're lucky to have her come and visit us. But just on a personal note, I want to say that she's a close uh, colleague and mentor of one of my PhD students, Armina, who you all know and love, I'm sure, just like I do. And so I consider her part of my extended group family. So welcome to our colloquium. Thanks. Uh, thank you for having me, um, Carolyn, and pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, thank you for all your guidance and mentorship with Ermina. She, I'm like almost envious of the, how happy Ermina is here. <laughs> so I'm like, do I need a second PhD? Maybe I do. <laughs> um, so who knows where this will take us. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. And I, as I was thinking about what to talk about, uh, it was a real question, like what to talk about to this intelligent group here? What do I have to say? Uh, and then the only answer I could come up with, I could talk about what it takes to build industry real applications that people use and adopt in um, practice. Right? Uh, so that's what we will talk about. Um, and I think um, as uh, I have been th thinking about this topic more and more, I think in practice, uh, we may have heard this phrase in different ways, like uh, focus more on the problem as opposed to the algorithms. I call it like focusing on the task. Uh, because my specialty is mostly around augmenting or replacing human knowledge work. And I found that in many cases, it's about what is the actual task that humans are doing and why. Because the way humans are doing it today also could change. Like we may circumvent the exact processes that they may be using, the exact way they are doing, but the input and output, even the input could change. The output is what we are after if the output is a real symbol of what the purpose of that task should be. Right? So assuming that constraint, then that is what our task is. And in practice, what the actual task definition would be is, again, not a very easy kind of problem to solve. It takes quite a bit of intuition to think about what should be my starting point for the task and where do I cut off meaning what can AI actually replace, as opposed to let this other or these other components continue to be done by humans. Uh, and that, I think, um, dynamic is also something we often don't know, but we learn as we keep building and as we get feedback and as we you know, keep talking to people, try to implement, people reject whatever we have implemented, all these things. So these are iterations, right? But in the end, you know, we do end up someplace which is mutually beneficial for the AI teams and for the users. Uh, there's something on the chat. Let me just check if, OK. Oh, yeah. People can hear. Just yeah. Audience. Yeah, good. OK. So uh, first of all, I thought uh, we talk a little bit about uh, what have I actually built in real life. Uh, so the first kind of thing uh, that uh, uh, at that time, I was an individual contributor a couple of years out of PhD. Uh, I had this chance to work on uh, something which is called Icon Search now. I was one of two people who built the first prototype for Icon Search. At that time, it was the world's first natural language search engine. So what it did was things which are very common now, like IBM, Q1, EPS, Target, like those types of things which are structured queries, uh, but the answer could be written in a not really natural language, but kind of pseudo natural language, but could be retrie retrieved from databases and returned to a human. But at that time, if people were like, oh, amazing, but uh, so we have come a long way since the last 10 years. Right? 
Uh, the second thing, which I'm still like very, very proud of, and Ermina and I had a chance to work on this, which is Reuters Tracer, which actually won several Best Paper Awards uh, for several modules that we had built and also several industry awards, uh, which at that time, um, it was a very interesting story. I'll talk about it. It was uh, the world's first uh, autonomous news agency, and it was um, attributed as Reuters Tracer, and it published directly to the trading terminal. Finally, the accuracy was that high and the speed was that high that Reuters uh, you know, was publishing directly using Reuters Tracer on the terminal. Uh, the last kind of thing I did at um, Thomson Reuters was Westlaw Quick Check, uh, which was a uh, tool uh, that lawyers could use to uh, draft uh, their briefs. So when the lawyers are drafting, uh, they need they put some arguments, and then those arguments could be. You know, uh, there could be other citations that could promote or negate those arguments. So, but right now, before uh, quick check, people would go and find those citations using laborious hours or whatever, and you know, large number of manuals and briefs they would read to find those citations. So we automated that process of this. That this is the actual argument, and this argument, you know, this case is supporting or this case is negating. So you could do it on your own brief or you could do it on your opponent's brief. Uh, it was a very successful product launch and we were lucky again, Armin and I worked on this, um, to have worked on this. Um, then after this, we worked on um, augmented intelligence for S&P uh, ratings, which was their flagship key transformation. Um, so this was not really one project. It was basically the first time that we did in which an entire function which was a real function, a real thing that a you know, pretty important function in the financial industry, which is ratings, but the how ratings is generated to move away from a human model to a AI augmented model in which AI was doing all of the groundwork of like finding the right documents for an entity. These are the financial ones. These are the legal ones. These are the news stories. This is the market data. Doing all the financial modeling, analysis, extractions from unstructured documents, showing it to an analyst. And the analyst would be, yes, I changed the ratings or I don't, looking at all the evidences that AI had found. Uh, which was, um, uh, again, a very interesting story of like, even when theoretically your models are high performing, but when you go and actually, uh, you know, real functions have to change, and what are the organizational structures that then need to change? Because sometimes we create thinking that, yeah, I mean, these are modules, but then those modules may actually translate to organizational hierarchies in real companies, and those hierarchies are not exactly aligned to the way we constructed our modules. So what exactly are you replacing? Who? Those people and how will it actually fit in a new operating model, that was the first time we discovered that these said things exist, right? that the organizational hierarchies matter, and then you know, how people think about it, and then some people may accept or some people may reject it. So there were some interesting dynamics there that if of interest, we can go into. Uh, and at JP Morgan, we have done a number of different things of which uh, I will um, definitely speak about a few use cases here. Um, but uh, I mean, the last point of the transformation and growth is basically now um, I think the use of AI, at least like from my vantage point and my specialty, uh, I think of as two key ways because I focus on more cognitive um, replacement. That one for transformation, because I think a lot of companies have already undergone those process transformations, Six Sigma, all those kind of things. But now I think the next level is going to come from AI. So when companies are going to change their models, they're going to go for higher productivity, especially like in the next five or 10 years, I think it's going to be AI that will be driving a lot of the digital transformation that companies will undergo. The second thing is new businesses. So uh, to give you an example, uh, there are existing models of growth in which people sometimes uh, hire very uh, expensive specialist elite people uh, who will go and do certain very specialized tasks. But then it becomes cost prohibitive to grow in different other segments. Right? You may have a very high value proposition, luxury kind of item for one segment, but maybe you, know, you want to grow in a different segment, which is a lower cost model. Let's say you were giving banking expertise or investment banking expertise to very large companies. And then that model, you know, so whatever percentage you are charging, it becomes quite high for a startup. 
So how will you then translate that investment banking expertise to a startup? It has to be mostly AI driven. Right? It cannot be a human, like highly specialized human who can go and give that expertise. But if you can build the AI to mimic what an investment banker could do, or 50% of what an investment banker would do for that segment, you can grow in that business. So I think that's the other lever, that AI is gonna help a lot and is helping a lot today. And we can talk about an example uh, today of how JP Morgan has uh, used AI to uh, grow into a new um, Capital Connect business, which actually targets a different segment, which JP Morgan couldn't go into because it was largely, it, it had it been largely a human drop model, but now it's mostly a digital and AI driven model. Um, so that's, uh, I think, the key areas where we are gonna look at. Now, in terms of when we focus on cognitive tasks, Again, the definition of the task is very important. And it actually, in my opinion, is the area that you know, somebody like me focuses a lot on. That getting that definition right in practice of this is what our actual problem is and how we are gonna solve it is often a make or break kind of decision. Uh, and there's a lot of creativity that goes into really thinking about what is the actual problem that we are trying to solve here. It may sound very simple, uh, but it's actually quite hard. Uh, and it takes like, sometimes like iterations for us to get it right. Uh, now, another thing is when we say task, um, often like you know, when I was a PhD student, uh, because I never actually worked in academia, I only studied, uh, I would often think um, you know, one problem is solved by one AI module, and that one AI module was you know, end to end solving a task. But in real life, it's actually an orchestration of pipeline of components that need to come together to solve that end to end task. Which was something that you know, was initially quite counterintuitive and you learn that oh, actually one box cannot solve it and you need these pipelines and then the exact sequence, orchestration, parallelism, whatever, all of these things also matter. So I have an example that I share with that. Um, now another thing which I found counterintuitive was that if you have the same data and you have a slightly different definition of the task, you may end up with a completely different AI approach to solve it. And we'll talk about this, like why does that happen? Now another, at the end of the spectrum, like we talk a lot about data and the use of data, but I mean, we should also say that you know, even if there is no data, AI still exists. So, we can still do AI without data, and I'll talk about an example for that. Um, now, often, for highly complex cognitive tasks, you go to a person and ask them, explain to me how you arrived at that decision, there's a lot of tacit knowledge involved. They cannot actually explain it to you. Right? And what they explain may actually sometimes lead you in a completely different or wrong direction. So what we find quite useful is actually looking at the output, not asking. What got done, and then what, when the AI produced is an output, getting them to evaluate the output, and the yes or no, or the reasons why it works, it doesn't work, those types of input and feedback are much more important than first hand asking like, how did you do it, or label the data for me, or things like that. Which again is like something counterintuitive, uh, and you'll tell me if yes or no later, uh, but uh, in practice, like that's what works better. Uh, and then we'll summarize with some of our you know, thinking and we'll do you know, some pros or cons or debate. Uh, that would be nice. Um, so let's talk about the first point, that uh, why is it often um, orchestration of AI algorithms that are needed? So I'll talk about the Reuters tracer example because still in my mind that is the best example of that. So it was uh, right after Arab Spring and Reuters, as you know, is very, uh, a very famous uh, news agency, is one of the top, and uh, it's known for its accuracy and breaking news. And the reason it can do that one, um, they are very, very strong on, I would say, ethics, but also very strong on verifying information. Uh, now, back when fake news wasn't a thing, and it was 2013, they had already started noticing that news was breaking on Twitter, which was different from what had happened before. News would traditionally only break by news organizations, not by somebody else. But now people were paying attention, and things were breaking first on Twitter, and then they were breaking, uh, you know, 
then they were coming to news organizations, and news organizations were getting leads on Twitter. But the, also notice that the volume of tweets was very high, and you couldn't scale that model of verifying information on Twitter just by using human journalists. That model would not work. So they came to us and they said, like, could you build AI that actually reads all of these tweets and tells us that, hey, Reuters journalists, this thing here has not yet become a news story, but could become a news story and is relevant for a professional organization like Reuters, and you need to pay attention. And these are, are some evidences for or against it. Now, at that time, now it may sound like OK, but at that time, it was totally like science fiction <laughs> that it could happen. Also, you know, uh, when we were working on the project, um, I cannot, uh, you know, it, it was so common that people would come and tell us, like, couldn't you find a more relevant problem to work on? <laughs> but then only after a few years, fake news would become such a big thing. And by that time, like this, uh, you know, spoiler alert solution was there. Uh, that's why we are also talking about it. Uh, but uh, at that time, that was the problem. Now, one would think, if one would, didn't think about orchestration of models, that, hey, maybe I could take a bunch of tweets, and I could train a model and say, this tweet actually became a new story. This tweet didn't. I would label some data. I would do some machine learning. I would find some features. And then, boom, what would be the results? And that was our first model. Uh, and then the journalists hated it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then that was like a humbling experience in which we sat down with them and we thought, okay, like what is wrong with this? Uh, and when we labeled our own tweets and our own results, uh, we also realized we were far too generous with ourselves. Um, so it turns out that that is not how journalists look at tweets. Uh, that is not how they verify information. And it also turns out that uh, by that time, uh, the machine, when it actually was tested in a go forward sample, everything had already become news because we were using metrics like volume and things like that, which were problems if you were to detect the first account, like the first time that something could become uh, you know, a breaking news story. So then the, that one thing of what is the first tweet that we need to identify and has not yet become a news story threw out a bunch of things that we could use, right? But then we... Uh, ask them, like, how would you do it? You know? And they told us things like, hey, I would look at the source. I would look at where is this person located? What is the topic they are talking about? Are they even credible? So then we completely changed our methodology to then like, focus on those types of things that these human domain experts were telling us that that would be the kinds of thing how a human journalist would do it. Um, now, having said that, I would caveat by saying that it is not always that we do exactly what a human journalist or a human uh, you know, SME uh, subject matter expert would tell us, sometimes like they turn out to be wrong. Sometimes they turn out to be partially correct. So these are like iterations that one has to take, right? Um, so in this case, now the other thing to note is that uh, Reuters journalists, like they are 3,000. There were 3,000 of those journalists at that time. And then they focused on very different areas. And tweets are like very different topics. Uh, so then. Also, in some of our analysis, we found that 99.999% of tweets were totally irrelevant from a Reuters journalist standard perspective. So then the question is also, like, how do you get rid of them? Do you do a topic categorization on all 100%, which was at that time like one, you know, 700 million or something? Or do you first like, filter them out? And then off the small slice that remains, do you do topic categorization on those? So in our case, like we found that the latter was much better performance uh, to do topic categorization once you have filtered out. Now, the filtering out is also important. It actually, in the end, turned out to be four or five different modules that we had to create and sequence. Like, first, we were doing like, you know, completely bot detection throughout all the bot-generated stuff. Then we were doing spam detection. We were doing mundane chat conversation detection because like, you know, some high schooler news is probably not relevant for writers. right? <laughs> So those types of things. So, uh, and then uh, bad word detection, uh, profanity detection, uh, you know, those types of things. So uh, we created actually a stack of just filtering. Um, as, and these are like some examples of things that, you know, like unrelated content, advertisement, spam, that the machine would identify, get rid of those. Uh, now, once we got rid of those, uh, then the next question was, that 
you know, of the remaining content, how do you organize it? And then we found this very simple method that actually scaled and generalized very well. We started, you know, basically it was a, a, a key phrase detection algorithm that worked on small text, a micro text, and uh, we just saw that if there are two key phrases, and then we clustered around the two main key phrases, the algorithm clustered very nicely from a human intuition interpretable point of view that the journalist could make sense, oh, okay, by looking at these two key phrases, I can guess what this cluster is gonna be about. Uh, and that algorithm, simple algorithm, actually you know, uh, turned out to be quite useful. Uh, now the next thing to realize, uh, which was again like, at first like not obvious to us, is that uh, you cannot verify opinions. <laughs> uh, so you can only verify uh, assertions of facts. Uh, so then we created this uh, sp opinion versus fact classifier uh, to get rid of opinions. Uh, now, it, it looks simple in beginning, but then you can also think about like all the edge cases and all the places where things are a combination or somebody said something. So it's an assertion that, hey, this person expressed this opinion, you know, those types of things. So it can get tricky, but we didn't actually get into all these complications. Um, uh, I think for us, like just a simple fact versus opinion uh, worked well, and um, and in part because other things were getting rid of other unrelated things, and then um, the other kind of uh, important thing to remember here is that um, when we think about outcomes or success criteria for those algorithms um, or for certain tasks, that is also an important thing to think about. Uh, so in this case, or in the news business, you could see one or two extra news that would not be so bad. But if you miss an important news, that is terribly bad. That if Reuters did not report on an important story for like five hours, like that would be super, super bad. But if Reuters reported on a story which was not that important, but I mean, not like high school, mundane conversation, whatever, those types of things, but like something which was you know, um, slightly not what they would have reported, that would have been okay and people would have let, you know, not mind that. Um, so um, we organized the information, we detected the assertions of facts, uh, we found in those uh, clusters relevance and then uh, we created another algorithm for credibility, we created another algorithm for summarization, what are the key insights that people are talking about uh, and all of those things and then finally we created a verification module uh, which was quite complex, and it uh, required like both uh, uh, knowledge bases that we had to create by looking at all of Twitter. Uh, one clever algorithm that uh, one of the people in the team created was um, he looked at all verified accounts and the tweet list that people have. Uh, for example, like Bill Gates' tweet list. Uh, who is he following? Uh, who he has he listed? Uh, and then if Bill Gates has listed certain people under the title technology, we think that person is credible. Uh, so that way we you know, grew a network list of about 200,000 people and credible sources. We looked at uh, then, you know, if any event happened, we could triage that information on, okay, if this is a technology-related news, what are the technology-related experts saying on Twitter about it? Are they even saying anything about it or not? Uh, and those were again like metrics that helped us in verifying. We looked at, uh, we created one um, AI algorithm just for witness account detection, uh, because that turned out to be a completely different model, which is an interesting thing now, because at that time we created so many different modules, but now with the change in foundational uh, models and things like that, uh, one would have to think like, is that how you would do it today? But at that time it was like, specialist witness detection, specialist opinion detection, specialist uh, geographic location, you know, that type of thing. Um, and all of these came together and then uh, turned out that with just three tweets, uh, the algorithm had human-like accuracy in verifying information, uh, which was quite impressive. Now the other thing which uh, I should mention, mention is, like the algorithms then reach the efficacy and the efficiency that was required of them but then the other challenge is the breaking news part. So if the algorithm did their job, but they did it slowly, and then by the time the tweet was generated and the news got published, 
it was like one hour because the algorithms are processing, 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 like it wouldn't matter. So then the tech stack in practice is also important, that it gives you the level of efficiency you actually need. So in the end, with our tech stack, you know, by the time a cluster was formed and the algorithm said yes, true, and newsworthy, and verified, and important enough, uh, to the time it got published, it was only 42 milliseconds. So uh, that was, and then it was um, uh, basically like the first year it went into production, 54 of the 57 world's biggest stories were breaking by Reuters Tracer. And that was not something even we were expecting that it could be that great in like first year of in production. Uh, and these stories were like really big stories. Uh, you know, some of these you might have seen, like the Brussels bomb or the explosion um, of the rocket or things like that. So um, the, the primary elections and things like that. So they were like really big stories and all of them were broken first uh, by Reuters Tracer. Who knew? <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, then, um, I mean, we published uh, these findings and um, you know, this was a nice quote from the editor-in-chief uh, who was our business partner in this case that it gave Reuters like a eight to 60 minute head start. Uh, and then um, just with the three, actually I said three, but it was five, okay. Uh, five tweets, it could have human-like accuracy uh, and then uh, against all. And I think the other kind of non-intuitive part for us was that we initially thought it would only work on English language, but it turned out it worked on a multitude of languages even though we hadn't explicitly coded for it. And the reason was because humans uh, wanted to be the person who first expressed that in English. So as soon as something was happening in some native language, they were translating it and putting it in English, and Tracer was then capturing that early tweet, which was great for us. Um, so that was our first use case about why you need an orchestration of algorithms and why all of these algorithms and platforms need to come together to make a successful kind of AI product. I'll pause for reflections. If not, I'll go into the second use case. You have a question? Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, good thing I'm not working on Twitter these days, for sure. Uh, 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 at that time, uh, it was, uh, you know, 1% was uh, completely free, 1% filtered was free, uh, and with the, basically we created the whole thing with just the free feed. Uh, and so uh, now I don't know. Uh, yeah, it, it got harder after the acquisition. I don't think it missed anything. Um, it, uh, yeah, we actually had so many people who were skeptical that we did very extensive benchmarking. I don't think it missed anything. Um, and uh, in fact, there was a funny story that uh, one time uh, we, when we created a vertical for it for like supply chains, uh, monitoring global supply chains. They were also like vendors who were providing some supply chain data and news stories, things like that. Um, and then it back came the evaluation. Uh, and then it was something like, you know, uh, 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 the Reuters Tracer had 47% coverage of what the ideal kind of coverage should have been. So theoretically, like they missed, uh, Reuters Tracer missed some things. Now it turned out that um, uh, all the third parties combined had only 23, and Reuters tracers just by one had 47. So, I mean, if somebody doesn't put a new story on Twitter and we don't get it, it's kind of out of scope for us what to do. But uh, still, like, it was quite interesting that people were translating and putting all these things on Twitter and we were able to catch it, and it was like larger than all third party data combined. So, 
So I guess that would be the case. Like if nobody puts it on Twitter, we miss it. Um, the only thing could have been, actually, Carolyn, I'm thinking more about it, was that it could have been slow. Because at some point, it would have been too big to be ignorable. Mm -hmm. So I think the only thing would have been, it could have been slower. Like on three things, it was slower. So, but do you remember what the thing was yeah. that it was particularly slow on? It yes, was? yes, we do remember very well. And those things were when human journalists were in the room when the news broke because they were expected events. Um, as you can tell, we were obsessed. <laughs> um, one of the um, so next thing which I want to talk about is that um, you know, people uh, focus a lot on data. Um, but you could have the same data and just a slightly different definition of the task. And you could end up with a completely different AI approach to it. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, so many of you might have heard about like GameStop and all of that uh, meme stocks. And uh, I heard like you guys made a lot of money out of it. <laughs> uh, so all wealthy people here. Yeah. So uh, when all the retail trading were going on, uh, JP Morgan uh, you know, doesn't do those types of like gambling type of things. Uh, but it could still, um, you know. First of all, I forgot to say, these, I'm sharing my own personal opinions, not of my employer. I should have explicitly said that so um, earlier. Uh, so, uh, but then they could be affected by these things if like, the market was moving in a very significant way. Um, so the uh, traders and the quantitative researchers, they came to us and they said, hey, okay, we think like there is something happening here. Uh, and by that time, the big story hadn't broken. So other people like, kind of didn't know. They just like were monitoring, and they thought something is happening here. They said, and we are like finding that people are like doing these things on Reddit. But you could you like come up with an early indicator for us, uh, for us to know, so we can keep out of those stocks. Like we don't want to be involved. And so that you know that it would be our risk management kind of thing that we would stay out. Uh, so one would again like think that yeah, I mean you could use something like volume and interest and uh, you know, uh, come up with some metric on, hey, you know, these people are so positive on this stock, these people are so negative, and it's trending, so it's likely going to become a target for a short squeeze, so hey, traders, stay out of it. But then the first version when we put, like, it was too late uh, for them. So you know, by the time they have to be alerted and put risk management things in practice, uh, it probably couldn't be done because it was already affecting their portfolio. So then again, the key word here is, uh, you know, with a leading time, uh, you need a leading indicator. So when you think about the word leading indicator, then your algorithm completely changes. Then you want the influencers who are going to go first. Um, I mean, not that these guys are actually influencers. Or no, I don't know. These are just random pictures of the internet. Uh, but uh, whoever are the influencers, um, uh, you want to know the first time they take a position or they express a position. And you know that other people will react to it. And you know other people are going to do something about it. Um, so then our algorithm quite changed, and it became an influencer detection algorithm as opposed to a volumetric and sentiment type of algorithm. Um, it's the same data, same everything, just one word changes everything, no? Of the definition of the task. Um, now, the other kind of um, end of the spectrum here is, what if there is no data? Uh, but, uh, which is actually quite a common problem uh, in real life. Like, people want to do things, and they want to, you know, AI to do things for them. But then when you say, oh, do you have data? Well, no. Or it's like you know in our like systems, but like programmatically you cannot access it. Like what you're going to go and like type write down on what what you're going to do? You can't like actually use that data. So um, then how do you build AI? But we can still build AI. Uh, so this is a work uh, that is done by my colleague uh, Natraj Raman, um, who um, actually this group would be interested in this. Um, he uh, works quite a bit on uh, synthetic. Uh, data, and he applied it, uh, in this case, to synthetic documents. Um, so determining layout is quite a hard problem 
in NLP that you want to detect, you know, where is the table, and then maybe you want to extract uh, different uh, rows and columns or field values from tables and things like that. Maybe you want to detect where is the headline, because the headline would contain some extra information content, things like that. But uh, how do you um, detect it? So his uh, idea was that you actually first create label data yourself. And how do you create label data? You create synthetic documents, and then in those, you explicitly place tables, you explicitly place pictures, you place headlines, and because you are generating, rather like the machine is generating, your code is generating, it knows where it placed different tables, headlines, footnotes, um, numbers, whatever, footer, um, pictures, all these things. And once you generate enough variety of such documents and such layouts, maybe all of those can then be used as training data. So uh, that's exactly uh, what he did. Uh, and then uh, these are some of the random variables or like the different types of like template types because uh, they could also have a lot of variety. Um, and then uh, the document structure could have variety, like it could have like multiple margins or no margins, columns, footers, et cetera. Uh, it could have a header or not, um, you know, different types of other parameters within each of these variables. Uh, and then you could have different types of distributions also. Uh, and then the Bayesian network then like generated all of these different types of, um, and these are then the examples of the documents it generated. Um, and as you can see, there is already like a good variety in this. Um, but then also you could have other types of, you know, variety in it as well. It could be scientific, it could be reports, it could be other types of uh, pictures. Uh, it could be other languages. Um, it could be uh, different types of highlighting. Uh, it could also be noisy because that is also the kind of documents you see in real life. It could be scanned. It could be like seeping through. Uh, it could be uh, very, you know, partial as well. Uh, and then the domain could also be different. Right? These are then synthetic resumes. Um, and in many cases, because of private information and things like that, you can't even like use certain types of documents. But if you know they are completely synthetically generated, it may be fine. Um, and then, uh, you know, the key idea here being that uh, then if you use those as your training samples, uh, then in the detection, you actually end up with results that are almost at par with what you would have got had you got human experts to go and label like, hey, this is the bounding box for a header. This is the bounding box for an image on this page. This is the bounding box for a footer on this page. Um, and the, I mean, this one was like zero labels, all completely synthetic, and uh, less than 4% um, average F1 difference between the real and synthetically doc used documents. Um, uh, and then the same concept uh, he applied then on um, visual task as well. Um, that, um, you know, the visual task is here that, you know, you may have used um, um, these technologies that you can then you know, for your verification of documents and onboarding and things like that, you use your picture and you use a document, which is an ID document, and then the machine will check and say, hey, you are actually the right person. Why don't you move your face a little bit? Why don't you, you know, change whatever? So it is a real person, um, and then that's the person in the image, and then checks that you're the right person or not. Uh, but again, for those types of problems, because of private information, it's very, very hard to get like real samples. So these types of synthetic documents and synthetic um, generated pictures are very um, useful in those types of contexts as well. Um, so uh, that's what uh, we did in that use case also, that you could generate um, pictures and, um, under different types of obstructions, under different types of scenes, um, so under different you know, scale, um, under different types of views, um, lighting, uh, so any like type of real life scenario that would affect, uh, you could encode for in as part of your parameter and generate labels for that. Another kind of interesting idea we're exploring now is looking at the error, and then seeing like based on the error, or you know what types of new or specialist training data should you extra generate for that error to go away. Um, so that also becomes very powerful. Then you're controlling for specific types of error as part of your training module also. Um, 
Then again, different types of textures, different types of objects, obstructions, um, proximity to different objects, um, 3D scenes, things like that um, you can also encode for. Um, and then, you know, so point being like you could have AI without data. The uh, kind of related point is that for um, many cognitive tasks, it's actually like a lot of tacit knowledge that humans hold in their head, and it's very hard uh, for them to express that if you try to get that domain knowledge out of them through like interviews or through like labeling. One of the best examples that I read about for this was uh, the initial like Netflix uh, recommendation algorithm. Uh, they um, how many of you already know about what I'm going to say? Oh, OK, good. Uh, so it will be novel. Um, so uh, the case was the first uh, Netflix uh, recommendation algorithm. They came up with a very fancy kind of uh, labeling method in which uh, when a user creates an account, they have all these like radio buttons to say, like, hey, in this genre, I like comedy. I do like this. I will give it like 1 to 10 score, or I do like action and this score, and you know these types of like very uh, kind of exhaustive uh, setup. It turned out we are very bad in saying what we like and don't like. Uh, and that algorithm, the recommendation algorithm was like completely wrong when it trained on that data. Uh, and uh, so later they started, they stopped asking people what they liked and not like, but actually uh, what they did. So this is the classic case of what you say and what you do are different. Right? And it's also like not that we want to lie about such things, but it's also just like how much can we capture and we have the, all the other nuances that made us say this particular thing are not captured when we make it a Boolean or when we make it a real number out of one out of 10 or things like that. Right? But when we say, yeah, I like this, if I really do like a certain movie, there are so many other hidden parameters or aspects that I can then infer based on the actual work or the actual task completion or the response or the output that gets generated. Um, and um, so uh, that concept of looking at the output of what a domain expert has actually done is something we find quite useful in real life. That as opposed to going and asking them, which is fine, like you get some information and some directional like guidance and intuition out of it, but a lot of it comes from what humans actually did and how they did it, and then asking them very specific nuanced questions, uh, if you have to, of why was it done this way, uh, or especially if it was different from what a uh, machine generated. Right? Uh, that is a better kind of faster mechanism to get to the end. Um, another kind of explicit way uh, that we also like explored was uh, this notion, which is very famous in business, of like finding insights. Like all the business leaders, they always want to find insights. But how do you find insights? Uh, so um, then uh, one of the kind of uh, more on the structured side of the insight case is like financial insights, because uh, they do have some meaning, and it's not like really like creativity-based uh, insights. It's like financial metrics-based insights. Uh, so in this particular case, actually, Ermine here uh, worked on this technology uh, in which we got, um, uh, was it like two samples, Ermine, <laughs> or something like that, of uh, like sheets in which like domain experts had insights. Uh, and then, um, so what Ermine did here was um, we got those insights, and then uh, we tried to backtrack how those insights were arrived at. Uh, so what she did was she generated a lot of like synthetic rows so for example, if the uh, thing was um, you know, like some percentage, uh, and then in the numbers here, then you actually, so the thing here was that you had an Excel sheet and you had a presentation with some insights. And you're trying to say, how did the human analyst come to this insight from these Excel sheets so that in future, when I see an Excel sheet, I can produce a similar insight or PowerPoint deck. So from these insights, you're looking at, OK, why are these ones who made it to the deck and the other ones didn't? And that is probably because there was some surprise or novelty factor in those numbers. So you probably want to look at some trends. You probably want to look at like what magnitude actually matters. So, and by doing that, you're then training that, hey, for this key metric, like units sold, or for uh, material compression over the last two years, if this range is more than this other number, 
it matters as an insight. And if it doesn't, then it probably doesn't matter as an insight. Uh, so basically, we backtrack uh, to infer like date periods, metrics, numbers, things like that, and then taught a machine with just two examples on, uh, in future, try to create these insights. And it was able to do that, which was quite interesting that on the structured side of insights, it could uh, just do with a very small set of samples. Um, so these were completely auto-generated commentary or insights based on new Excel sheets of new data that the machine got. Um, now, on the other end of the spectrum are the highly cognitive insights, because a person could read a large report and then come up with like really interesting, meaningful insights uh, that like a layman person or a layman scientist who doesn't have knowledge about that domain may not be able to infer, like, how did that happen, right? Uh, so for these things, uh, like, it's always like a problem for us. Like, how do we get to that state, sorry, in which uh, we are, I'm like, there's a video here. I'm trying to see if that could be, okay, it's fine. So, um, like, how do we infer, like, how did that happen? So in this one, we experimented with iGaze technology to see if we could identify zones of attention and if people paused on certain areas uh, that we could then use to infer that here, these are the key context or key areas to focus on or have attention and then come up with insights later based on that. Uh, we got only, I would say, like average kind of success so far. Uh, it is an interesting area, but I think it's also an area that one would really have to invest like more time and energy on to improve the accuracy for it to be you know, usable for that type of task. Um, now, to kind of conclude, uh, I think um, in industry, um, it's the task centricity that actually matters when we are building. Uh, and task and the purpose is often the more constant. The algorithms can change, data can change, Orchestration can change, right? The actual tech stack will change. All of the human domain expertise may also evolve. Like one human may some, something, if different may say something another. All of these things are variables. The actual purpose of what we are trying to achieve is the only constant, or the constant for a longer period of time. So I think task centricity matters. Understanding the actual task and how you think about framing the task matters. Uh, the actual path to solve that task often constitutes of these things, which I find important, and there could be more, but these are the ones that I think are especially important. Um, and then I do think synthetic data is actually quite useful in certain types of tasks, and uh, we should leverage it. Um, and then while uh, the IGIS technology today didn't get us as far as we want to go, but it's also a very interesting area. And I think like that understanding of context and attention, if you want to move away from black box models and want to understand like what things are actually meaningful, these types of technologies are quite useful and uh, we'd like to invest more time and research interest in that. Um, now the last thing I want to talk about is then, okay, if you do all these things, like are you guaranteed success? Will users adopt your tooling, even if it's like highly accurate and things like that? Uh, the answer may or may not be yes. Um, and then it's a question of trust and the question of adoption. So I often find that uh, people have converted this into an exclusively explainability-related conversation. While explainability is an important factor sometimes, uh, I also think uh, there are other factors. One of the most important factors, in my opinion, is robustness of output. So, you know, we use dishwashers every day. We don't question how they work, right? And the reason being that they work. If suddenly they started throwing dishes, then we would also like dig in and try to understand, hey, what happened here? Like something seems broken, right? If we touch a button in this way versus like this way and the output is different, like we would also not trust it. So, and I think similar is with AI models and our AI systems that if suddenly for like some input which is 0.3, your answer is 1,000, and for 0.32, your answer is minus five, yeah, users will have a hard time believing such systems. That, oh, suddenly, like, you know, who knows what else type of like large range error could happen in such systems. Um, so I think robustness of output and consistency of output is quite important. 
and uh, explainability has a place, but you know, I think these other things also matter quite a bit. Uh, the other kind of thing is um, the, like from just a practical perspective, like including users and their opinion uh, in like early modeling, making them feel more ownership, these things matter, but for certain things like, I don't know, like self-driving cars, like it may not matter. <laughs> uh, so we'll see. Um, I think that's the end of my talk. Yeah, that's right. Uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yes, please. So I um, co-teach an introductory NLP course. And one of the discussions that we always have or the things that we try to balance is like algorithms and architecture as opposed to tasks and applications. And so it's, it, it seems to me that in like education of students who are going into artificial intelligence fields, we do sort of need both of those things. Um, and you know, when we've tried to go heavier on the applications and tasks, then students have sometimes felt like there's not enough content, like they're not learning how to do things. And if we've gone too heavy, you know, heavier on the, uh, the applications and tasks, or, or on the, the algorithms, then we kind of feel like they, they don't have a perspective that will carry them you know, in the long term. So I'd like your uh, thoughts on how to thread this needle between you know, algorithms and tasks in the education of like, people who would go and work for you it's an excellent question, um, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, I should say that um, in the task kind of centricity, uh, it does not mean that you can ignore the algorithm side. In fact, the, what algorithm is useful for what type of task, I think is a very important concept that we don't often, you know, early, like, when I was young, I didn't have that as much intuition about it as I have today, because I have seen many, many algorithms work in practice now over time. Um, and I think um, uh, the understanding of how algorithms work, what type of assumptions we bake into certain types of algorithms, and that knowledge is very critical to develop that type of intuition. Um, it's a great question of like where, how do you teach that and how do you balance it? Um, perhaps by examples, uh -huh. right, of like things, like understanding the intricacies and then like what types of tasks will be suited for this and what types of tasks will not be, but as opposed to like, hey, just like right. we're suddenly only focusing on aeroplanes or something. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Oh. Yeah. Sure. For some reason, I'm already afraid of this question. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, this is actually not a question so much as, as an anecdote in support of your ideas about leveraging synthetic data. So, um, CNY Mellon, you know, guys are familiar with them, uh, very large bank. They not as good as JP Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> sponsored the project here in the LTI for us to build AI tools that would run inside the bank on customer data, but produce synthesized data that had the same statistical properties as the original customer data. And that synthesized data could be given to the outside contractors to build, to build the training model. So it's an AI model to develop data to be fed into another AI model. And the long story short is it works. It works, yeah. It's counterintuitive at first that it would, but it actually does, yeah. Right. Yes, Gavin. I guess I have a question about that. I mean, uh, so uh, I'm just seeing my student Luke over there. We, we both um, consult for um, NIH, and when it comes to data like that, generated data from other data, we've had discussions about how safe is it even, you know, to distribute a model that was trained on synthetic data or generating synthetic data. You supposedly removed everything from it, but they're always afraid 
some really smart person will figure out how to reverse engineer it. That's right. So on the finance side, um, are you guys less worried about that? Or, I mean, so have there been any sort of discussions? Lots. All? Absolutely. It's a great question. There have been many these types of discussions. Uh, and um, again, like this is my opinion. Uh, not the formal opinion of my employer or anything like that. But uh, so that's why in the model I presented, there is no real data ever. It's just like completely synthetically generated using like a Bayesian net with like different parameters based on a human's domain expertise of like this is, you know, a page or a document has headers, a page or document has footers or sections or headlines. So it never actually like saw real data. Uh, so I think our position is very much like don't even see real data. Yeah, I guess uh, though, I mean, it, maybe it's a ridiculous uh, paranoia, but sometimes people are worried that even if it never saw real data, the data that it saw was based on real data. And so yeah, in the human in there, head. There actually is real data. So yeah, how I mean, far away from the real data do you have to be to be safe? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, then it's like a very hard question to answer that, uh, Okay, could you reverse engineer then from a human domain expert the same way? If you question them long enough, could you infer back? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I was actually thinking about that when you were saying about AI not based on data, you know, like, oh, if it was just based on rules, well, but yeah. those rules are based on data, so. Yeah. <laughs> so is it really not data? <laughs> I think people are now like looking up our data, which is all <laughs> on the web. <laughs> uh, I, just, I, I have one question that I'm not sure if it's so related to like the technical comments here. I was wondering how people in like the traditional industry, like JP Morgan, oh, like traditional, yeah. were large, large models that had to be see how the entry theories could have been real world. Yeah. Uh, so, um, we had a lot of discussions about this in the recent uh, couple of months. Uh, so, uh, I mean, there are like uh, different opinions on this, right? Like different scientists in the group or you know, other groups also, uh, they have varying opinions. Um, I think overall it's a positive development and it's a positive development for the field of AI and uh, you know excitement and things like that. But I, I mean, this is again like my, like some people are very excited about it and some people are thinking like, oh, it's gonna replace this, it's gonna replace that. Um, I don't know if like that excitement is going to bear out. Um, we'll have to see. Uh, I mean, there are already like, you know, many shortcomings that people have already like benchmarked and. Uh, explored and things like that, but I mean, over time, one anticipates like some of them, if not all of them, would you know, um, be mitigated. Um, but I think uh, one cannot ignore the fact that this has happened, and one cannot ignore the fact that we could have the possibility of foundational models, and then the field of NLP could change. But I, at this point, I think it's going to be, for some cases, a new baseline, uh, and we'll still have to do like you know, different vertical models on top of that foundational baseline. Um, I think in some cases, it may be good enough to be used out of box. Uh, I mean, we were having this discussion earlier with uh, a couple of students that uh, often when we solve problems, it's actually not the 100% of the problem we are solving. Right? I mean, uh, often a baseline is also a human baseline. So let's say the human baseline is 70%. And maybe the AI model gets to like 80%. But on some like sliver of the problem, maybe it's like 99%, right? So the 99% has a much higher percentage of like being operationalized and used and adopted and, you know, human out of the loop, that type of thing. So maybe, you know, for like 20% of the problem it solves, maybe it will be a 
and if it actually does generalize well on a wide variety of problems, maybe it will take away 20% of a large chunk of horizontal work. That may happen. Because uh, it is a challenge. How do you create a realistic enough scenario in a class that students actually really get enough context that they that they can learn those skills? How do how do they get prepared to go off into industry and then be able to like come into a context and then figure it out? I guess my question to you is: When you get people from CU yeah. or other places coming to work for J.P. Morgan, to do they're this, already awesome. What are what are <laughs> what are the gaps? What could we be doing better? You know, what is it that our students Uh, it's a good question. I think it's um, uh, more of a, I think, a apprenticeship kind of model, that there are just some things you learn by doing. Um, so I think that actual doing, there is benefit in that. So maybe like an applied component or like a two month go and do this. You may already have these things, right? I think like those do have a impact, but it's also like a short period of time doesn't actually like get you the level of intuition. You know, years of expertise gets you there. So when you get students to be, I mean, so I guess what we do have is like, as far as I know, every single one of our professional master's programs has a requirement for an internship for at least one summer. So, uh, but I wonder though, sometimes when I, when I ask people what was your internship pro project, it seems like companies get interns and they put them in, you know, like, a, you know, a little box where they're working on some, something that's not of that nature. So my, my question to you is, um, you know, from your side, do you feel like it's a challenge? Or like, do you think of the interns who come as people who you're giving them that part of their education versus giving them something that's safe for you? I mean, so is yeah. this partnership, I guess, between universities and places like J.P. Morgan working for that? Yeah, um, it's a very good question. Um, I'm like thinking back to, um, you know, uh, Manuela uh, and how serious she treats the internship program. So it's almost like, like our job to make sure that the interns have a great experience. So we usually pair them with one, um, you know, VP in our organization. Uh, and then the idea being like, you know, try to get a paper out of it based on like real work. Um, now the paper often doesn't happen in, you know, that short window and people are like collaborating and writing the actual paper later, but you want to get to that to a stage. I think uh, to that point, coding skills are important, right? Because you actually have to code and uh, so I think the f easier and the more fluent people are in coding, like they don't need to be like real software developers, it's not a software development job, but like you have to be able to express your ideas in code. Um, that's our language, right? Like so we use. Uh, I think coding skills and fast coding skills are definitely things people, you know, scientists, you know, if you have time, like work on that. Like, um, uh, I think that is something. The real pro working on real problems, from my vantage point, that is not an issue, because we have so many that it, people will be, you know, like want to get help us, you know, if they can. But I think it's you're right. Like there is a point here around like context of Absorbing that context is hard sometimes. And I think that comes back to the point of actually understanding the problem as opposed to, hey, here is my quickest way to solve it. Um, I don't know if there's an easy answer, Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> I just want advice. What is your opinion on that? <laughs> what, is, what are your thoughts on it? What do you think we could do more of? Done. Um, as, as I just wonder, what has your experience been? Like, do you feel like the opportunities that have been presented to you, like to join in for those capstones, have been attractive to you, or like, what could we do better to make that seem, uh, you know, attractive to companies? 
I think people are quite excited about the cap store projects. Like I always see like email, like I haven't participated personally, but I always see emails coming and going, hey, my student, Capstone students are doing this. Hey, we are now demoing here, things like that. I think people are quite excited about it. Uh, and especially some of our like uh, um, early career employees, they are very eager to give back. Yeah, not that the older ones aren't, but. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I thought this was the social. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe what we'll do is sort of wander back over to JC um, and, and have snacks and people can ask questions not in the snacks or forum as well. Sure, sure. I'm yeah. sorry about that. No, 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 you're good. No, let's, thanks, Nina, once again, though. Thank you.